2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18, reading. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us back into thy house this morning, and especially on the Lord's day. Father, we come seeking once again the thorough cleansing and washing of all our sins. We plead with you, O God, that you would use your holy word to build strong foundation for thy church, and through the understanding of your word, thy people, Lord, would stand on this foundation and would be useful servants for you and for your kingdom. And Lord, we ask that you would now be in our midst to build convictions in our heart as we understand why we need a constitution in the church and what it serves and how as members we ought to respond. We ask and pray for all this for your kingdom's work sake. In Jesus' name, amen. So let us finish up the topic on the church constitution, right? So please remember, the church constitution is very important because it tells everyone who comes into a church what the church believes in, what are its practices and convictions. It helps to guide the church when there are disagreements. So don't look at constitution as something that is, well, just a formality. Constitution protects the church. Constitution promotes peace. Contrary to what most people think, well, Christianity should be all about love. And, well, we should put aside things like rules and um, obligations and expectations as long as we love one another. That is what the church is about. Well, it is true. It is always about love. That is how we ought to function. But the Bible reminds us that love must be in truth. All right? Love must be in truth. In other words, there must be also a basis for that love. And the constitution is always based on, well, biblical principles. So constitutions are very important. Don't look at them as um, unnecessary formalities required for a society, and we are a society in the eyes of the government, so we must have a constitution. Take this seriously. I say again, for those who wish to be members, um, take up membership, you must understand the constitution. For those of you who are members, then you must once again renew and refresh your understanding of the constitution and your responsibilities to it and ensure that you're living by it. All right? So now let us finish up this chapter on the church constitution. Now, by the way, any one of you who are seeking church membership, um, or transfer of membership or baptism, um, then please look for me for a copy of the Constitution. By and large, most of you here are members already, so I'm not going to print many, many copies. So let me know if you wish to have a copy of the Constitution. For members who have misplaced them, you can always look for me as well. All right? So the Constitution. Now turn your BBK books, please. Turn in your BBK books to page um, 230. 230. 230. All right? 230. The limits of the Constitution. Now, today we want to go into some details, some statements that we need to um, understand and have clarity about. And then how we, should, how we should respond must also be clear in our minds. Now, first and foremost, um, the limits. Now, please know that these are also taken from the, the Constitution that we have. Um, now, number one, the Constitution is not superior to the Bible. Always remember that. The final authority will always be the perfect word of God. Again, it is emphasized that constitution is a servant to the Bible. 
No church should create constitutions that suit ourselves. It must always be based upon biblical principles. All right? Now, number two. Now, any person who finds the constitution of the church too restrictive need not join as a member. Now, church membership is important. Church membership is very important. God desires, God brought in people into the church and it became part of the church. Church membership is important. No Christian should feel that, well, I just go to any church and then just hang around and just change church. That is not God's intent for the believer. When he saved you, he intended for you to be part of a certain church, a sound church. And then when God leads you to that church and you know it's God's will, you should take up membership. All right? Now, but we are not saying that church membership is important and therefore just join the church you are in. The constitution, uh, if you find that, well, after understanding the beliefs of the church, um, the practices of the church, I find that it is too restrictive. I find that it is something that I cannot subscribe to, something that I cannot in conscience um, sub, um, submit to, then you should not, you need not take up membership. Because at membership um, intake, baptism makes you um, the, the natural member of the church as well. You will take vows, all right? You will take vows. And if you cannot in, um, take a vow, um, and keep them because you don't believe in certain things, then you should not take up membership. We are not saying that we don't welcome you. I right? have said that many times. But you should come to learn. You should not just say, well, I'll just attend church. Um, you should learn and, and ask yourself, well, what, what is it that I cannot accept? Then ask, all right? Ask the pastor. Clarify those things. But at the end of the clarification, if you still feel that, well, I cannot subscribe to this, we welcome you to continue to worship. But we've said many times, and later I'll cover that, um, do not cause um, discord in the church because you want to impose your own beliefs on a church who has made its convictions and practices clear in their constitution. All right? We'll come to that more afterwards. Now look at your BBK books. The Constitution is not able to bind anyone's conscience. All right? God alone is the Lord of conscience. Now, so what is it saying? The Constitution is very clear. Now, if you have a very strong conviction, for example, maybe you feel very strongly, all right, that um, baptism must be by immersion alone. All right? A baptism that is not through immersion and sprinkling alone is is not proper baptism. There are Christians who feel very strongly about that, and we've already covered why we believe in sprinkling, all right? But at the end of the day, you find it is, is your conscience cannot allow you to, to, to um, agree to sprinkling. Then it cannot bind your conscience. And there may be some biblical um, truths in the Bible where the Lord is not specifically clear. For example, even as we study eschatology, all right? Is it pre-tribulation, uh, mid-tribulation, and all that? You, you, un, you heard the arguments, but you find that, well, you disagree with certain things. Well, it is something that your conscience must, must rule. But please understand this. Conscience ruling does not mean that, well, I believe that um, churches should have um, women pastors, and the word of God is clear, right? You can say, well, my conscience on this thing is, is that, it's okay. Why? Yeah, I know the Bible says so, but in my heart and mind, I, I disagree. Conscience is not you disagree with the Bible and it's your conscience. All right? So be clear about such things. Now then we move, all right? We move further down. Um, point number four. Now at any time, a member feels that he cannot agree or abide by the Constitution and finds it too restrictive. He is free to move on to find another church that is more suitable to his understanding and interpretation of the word. Now, this is important. Now, there are a few situations where um, you may face as a worshipper in a church, right? The first one is, well, you join church membership. Then, well, over time, you find that you begin to disagree with certain things. You change. All right, so one is, it can be you changed, all right? Or it can be um, 
You never understood clearly certain things, and sometimes it's like that. People don't read the Constitution, people do not pay attention during church catechism like that, and they just want to join the church. I just want to join the church. I just want to be a member of the church. They don't pay attention um, to what is taught regarding the church um, interpretation, beliefs. Then over time you say, oh, but actually I don't agree to those things. So you, you begin to um, change or you begin to realize that you did not agree. Now what should you do? So that's one situation. Now second situation can be the church changed. The church changes. This is the constitution that we have, but over time the church doesn't follow the constitution, all right? The church practices things against the constitution. Now, what to do? Or there may be another situation where you have not changed, the church has not changed, but someone else changed and wants to try and influence you to try and change the church. So there are three situations that you can face as a member in a church. Now, what should you do in such situations? Well, let's cover the first one. So you must be clear in your own hearts as members or as people who want to join church membership. Now, the first one is this. You changed, all right? Or you realized that you did not understand that clearly and now you understood it. Um, as the church teaches it, you, you do not agree anymore. Well, the first thing that we must learn is, well, you are free to move on to another church. Now, I want to clarify. We're not saying that, well, just go. We always encourage you to seek further clarification, all right? Because church membership is important. Don't throw it away. Don't give up or don't decide not to be a church member lightly. It is God's intent to give us churches on earth than to draw people in there. Then it's God's intention for people to commit themselves to a church. Because if you are not a church member, you are not committed to the church's work. And there are many things that we cannot allow you to do as a, as a, as a, as a, as a worshipper when you are not a member, all right? We shall say a bit more afterwards. Now, when, when these things happen, seek clarification. Speak to the church pastor about those beliefs. Or maybe you see certain practices um, that you, you wonder about. Speak to the church pastor, all right? Now, at the end of it all, if you cannot, you still cannot, in your conscience, agree to it. And you have your interpretation of the Word of God. Now, I hope that it is not a, a case where it's a perverse interpretation, all right? Um, then one, you have two things that you can do. One is, well, you stay on. But in those areas, you know that you disagree, and then you just know that this is what the church believes, you respect it, you don't cause problems, all right? And you're very welcome to stay and continue to learn. Or if it troubles you so much, then the best thing in your own heart to do is then find a church where it agrees with your um, interpretation. For example, I've mentioned like maybe immersion, all right? Some feel very strongly about that. Um, then you feel that, no, it's only immersion. Now, we do not say that if you are immersed in, in, in baptism, then we will not let you partake of the Holy Communion. So if you are immersed in your previous church, well, if you understand what baptism is, then you continue to take the Holy Communion. But there are some Christians who believe if you are not immersed, you cannot take the Holy Communion even. There are churches who practice that, right? Now, if you feel so strongly, then you have to find a church that helps you, right? To, um, that agrees um, with or you agree with that church's practices. So that, that is something you can do. But now I want you to look at point number four. Can we read, can we read this um, Ecclesiastes 5, 4 to 5 together? Now reading. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that shouldest not vow than that thou shouldst vow and not pay. Right? So always remember, church membership it's a time where you will take vows. If you don't intend to keep those vows, means you don't agree with those things, you don't intend to practice it, then don't take those vows. 
Now, one of it we've covered in great detail has been biblical separation, right? And we just read, is the Bible. The Bible says that it's a biblical separation come out from among them. We studied the false movements in Christianity. Um, so we come out from among them. Now, I give you um, some examples of areas of where we say we believe in biblical separation. Now, in our constitution, if you look at page 232, all right? Point six, six point seven. The commands of God to his people is to be separate. And we read these verses of at least 2 Corinthians just now. Come out from among them. Now, what are some areas that we will not um, cooperate with? We will not work with these people or these movements. 6.8. Now, you must understand in your heart and know clearly. We oppose all forms of modernism. What is modernism? We studied in detail as well. By and large, well, they reject um, the veracity of the Bible. Well, miracles are just, um, just stories. They believe in science, well, so-called science above God's word. All right? Science says it's evolution. It's evolution. It's not creation, even if the Bible says so. So, example of it. So, we are against modernism, cultism, Romanism, Roman Catholicism. We also studied that in detail. Right, false religions. Now, dialogue for the purpose of reaching a compromise of all true believers and representatives of such beliefs is impious and unbiblical and treasonous and unfaithful to the Holy Word. So now, if you feel that, no, I believe that we should work with um, the Mormons, work with the modernists, work with the liberals, work with new evangelicals, then you should not be a member, all right? Because um, we make it very clear. The Bible says, come out from among them. What about 6.9? 6.9. Now, also, other areas, new evangelicals, right? New evangelicals, we also studied. They put the social gospel above many truths, right? Their focus is about the social good of men, not um, the truth, first and foremost. Could they believe in cooperative evangelism, unity over truth, science first as well, all right? So, new evangelicals, charismatic movement, all right? Um, those that promote ecumenical movement through cooperative evangelism. For example, you, we, I showed you the members in the, new, in, in the World Council of Churches. You see names of churches in Perth that are very popular, that outwardly appear to be, well, sound in their teaching, but they are part of the World Council of Churches. We don't work with them, all right? So, because they're part of the ecumenical movement, so all these things, um, um, all these movements. Now, and please note, 6.9. And all churches and other movements and organizations that are aligned with or sympathetic to the ecumenical movement. Aligned with or sympathetic to. So don't just think that, well, they use the King James Version, all right? They believe in the fundamentals of the faith. Well, then it is fine to uh, have cooperative evangelism, uh, mission work with them, and so forth. Well, it is fine to um, jointly work with them on spiritual projects. Those that align with, those that are sympathetic to, means they do not speak against the ecumenical movement. They say, well, we, we know that they are wrong, but, but you know, they are good people. Let's, let's, be, let's, let's not judge them. So they're sympathetic to them. They continue to support their work. Now, God says, come out from among them means you don't support them. Not come out and then support them. Understand that biblical separation is a loving doctrine. When you, when they see that you change towards them, they will begin to ask, why? And then you explain to them why they are wrong. It is to help them come out of the false movements into the truth with you, all right? Continuing to be sympathetic, supporting um, them is not going to help them. Remember that, all right? It's just the same as um, um, when you are knowing that someone is infected with COVID-19, all right? You must take precautions yourself. You isolate yourself and then you help them from without, not just go within them and then be with them and then you get infected as well, right? So, 
Now, if you still feel, well, we, I, I think well, it's too restrictive. Well, Christianity is all about love. Work with anyone. As long as, well, they, they so-called sing hymns and then they, they have King James Version, we'll work with them. Now, the next one is, is this. Um, turn back to point number four. Now, but if at the end of the day you feel that, well, I, I really don't believe in biblical separation, I don't believe in um, that tongues have ceased, I don't believe um, in miracles, uh, healing, um, this, I believe that this should be happening all the time and regularly like before, I don't believe that these things have ceased, then, well, you can either say, well, I continue to learn, but I won't cause problems. You must not cause problems. Now, let's read Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. 6, 16 to 19. Let us read. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him, unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, notice that God says very clearly, that he hates the person that sows discord among brethren. So if you disagree with something, you've already taken a vow to um, study the peace of the church, to support the church. You've done that and then now you break that vow, number one. And number two, you go around trying to persuade people. It's very common in churches, how churches end up with so much problem and split. They begin to invite people to their homes. Come, come to my house. Have a meal with us. Oh, under the pretext of, of Christian kindness, love, uh, fellowship. But the intent is to sow discord. You know the church believes in this. What do you think? You know the church and, and all that kind of problems will arise, right? The young, the innocent ones, they begin to doubt. They begin to wonder, all right? This is not the way to do it. You have a problem, you disagreement, speak with the church leaders. It's not to try to raise groundswell, right? Turn people against the church. Do you break your vow? Now, I've shared this many times when, when I disagreed with my first church, um, um, when it began to change in its stand on the King James Version, began to change in its stand on certain other areas. Um, I brought it up in the session, right? And they say, no, this is how it is. Um, this is what it is going to be. I just have to quietly leave. I don't go around um, influencing those who I've been teaching in Bible studies to change. I quietly live after raising it with the um, congregation. I can stay, but my conscience feels that, um, my conscience pricks me. I, I cannot accept those things. No church is perfect. Understand that, all right? But we have to know that at the end of the day, if there are things that we disagree with, we have to abide by our vows. That is what vows are for, to keep the peace of the church. Do not sow discord, all right? Now, why is this so important? Because the church is to do the work of God. When you sow this court, there will be chaos. There will be distractions. The church leaders, instead of doing God's work, will be constantly um, fighting um, um, chaos and disagreements in the church. So you must respect that, all right? So please understand that. Now, what about the second case? <clears throat> The second case where um, the church changes, all right? The church changes. What can you do? Well, I mentioned already, you, you can leave um, after speaking to them and they would not change. Now, the other thing is this. The Constitution allows for us to call for an extraordinary meeting, all right? There is a provision now, we are going to have our annual congregational meeting on the 17th, but there is such a thing as an extraordinary meeting. Now, it is for the transaction of particular business pertaining to the church. They may be held at any time upon due notice being given. So, now you may question, well, if the church has gone wrong, for example, now they begin to subscribe to supporting ecumenical movement. Do you have a responsibility as a member well, to help the church, of course, of course. 
by speaking to the leaders first. Now, but after speaking to the leaders and you find that the leaders say, we are not going to change. Now, you can call for an ECM. The, what are the conditions? There must be at least one-tenth of the communicant members agreeing to having an ECM, Extraordinary Congregational Meeting. Now, before I go further, please don't be trigger-happy when, when it comes to ECMs. I don't agree with the church carpets being grey. Right? I want to call for an ECM. I don't like our worship time. I want to call for an ECM. It is not meant for those things. All right? It's meant for um, serious doctrinal matters or um, spiritual um, conditions that the church is ignoring. That kind of um, severity. All right? So don't call for ECM because I don't like my personal preference is not to have English and Chinese congregation. I want to call for an ECM. Those are directions of a church. It is not unbiblical, all right? So, now, so back to this. But then you wonder, now, if I need to raise one-tenth in order to call a uh, mem uh, um, ECM, and these are all must be communicant members, uh, not even associate members. So, now, how, how do I not sow discord? Because I need to talk to people to get their signatures, to have an ECM. Now, remember, the, the, the constitution is, quite, is very clear. Now, the church cannot say we will not have an ECM if one-tenth of the communicant member agrees to have it, right? But the approach is always speak to the leadership. Why are we now joining the World Council of Churches in Membership? Right? It has always been against our constitution. Our constitution has always been against that. Why is the church changing? It says we are ignoring the constitution. We're going to go ahead with that. Then you tell the church leaders, I, for the protection of the church, it is against constitution, against the Bible, obviously. I will speak to certain members, all right? inform the church, because I wish to call for an ECM. All right? Don't go underhandedly and um, stir problems. Always do it properly. Do it properly. So that's, that's one avenue that you have. If you say that, well, I don't want to leave. I feel that I should do this. Now, at the end of it all, you must realize that these things must be done not to sow discord. It's done out of love and protection of the church and its members. All right? So the spirit, the attitude is very important. Likewise, the church can call an ECM as well. All right? So the church feels that, well, I think moving forward, there is this battle in, 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 in Christianity and we need to take a clear stand on this issue. All right? The church can call it ECM and say, we want to now include this in our constitution to make very clear our stand on, for example, um, um, VPP, preservation of scriptures. It is implied already, but we want to make it clearer. The church can also call for an ECM. All right? Now, let's come back to this. So, you change or the church changes. Um, and then the third one. Now, what happens if someone has changed and sows discord? What should you do as a member? You should always remember your duties as a member. You should tell them, now, this is not good. Have you spoken to the church leaders? Well, we have and we are, that's why we are calling for ECM. Then you make sure you ascertain that. And if they're just going around saying, you know, you know this, this decision, that decision, then I remember it's very common in churches, and I understand in our history the same. There will be people, they invite you to the house, barbecue, and, and all that kind of, after some time. Now, it's a hidden agenda to try and change the way you think. What should you do in those situations? You should talk to the person and say, we should go to the church leaders now and speak with them. That's the best, all right? Um, you don't need to say, well, well, I listen to you, then I secretly go and tell the church leaders. When people are doing that, you just openly say, let's, let's, let's have a meeting with pastor, all right, um, and, and talk with him together, all right? That is the way to protect the church, okay? So, now that is about the constitution in terms of fulfilling our vow in not sowing discord, which is why we keep emphasizing, if you don't agree with the church beliefs fully, do not be a church member. You know, some people, they, they, they're very worried about not being a member. Um, I, I came to understand in some, 
for in the minds of some elderly. They feel that they need to be a member of the church because if they die, when they die, the church will, will conduct their funeral. We will conduct your funeral as long as you're a worshipper of the church. If you're a regular worshipper, we will conduct your funeral. All right? But don't just join the church, ignore your conscience, um, just, just for the wrong reasons. All right? So I just want to clarify that. I never realized they were so important to some people. They kept thinking that we will not conduct their funeral when they die if they're not members. It is not true. Now, let us come back to the Constitution. So a few other areas, all right? A few other areas in the Constitution. Now, highlights of the Constitution, point number two. Now, you will notice it says, it says Calvary Pandan BB Church. Now, the, this book is produced by Calvary Pandan, so they state their church name. If you look in, in our <coughs> Constitution, it will be our own name, all right? So you can strike it off and say BPCWA. Now, it's a militant church. We are a militant church. What does it mean? <clears throat> we are militant fundamentalists. <laughs> you put those two words together, it's scary. People have this idea. Militant fundamentalists means we take up arms, we instigate <clears throat> revolutions, we physically um, 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 uh, protest on the streets. We are not talking about that at all. Fundamentalism is simply... we. We subscribe to and we stand for the five fundamentals of the faith, which we've also learned. We believe in those. Now, militant means we are not just <coughs> um, um, saying we believe in it and that is all. Militant means we will actually defend and fight for those truths. All right? Whether it is preservation of scriptures, any of the fundamentals that are crucial, that are the basis for Christianity, what makes Christianity different from other religions, we will fight. We will fight. Means we will actually actively inform and teach against these false teachings. We will not go into a church and try and change a church. Please know that it is wrong. By the way, if you go to, maybe you have a, um, you, you, are, you go overseas to study and you need to be part of a church and that is the soundest church you can find, don't go in there and try and change the church, all right? It's the same principle upon you as well. You're not a member there. You're not supposed to sow discord there. Right? Worship uh, peacefully. Understand the differences. Keep it to yourself. All right? um, now, unless they keep asking you, then you speak in front of the church leaders. But don't sow discord there. Now, coming back to this. We are militant, meaning to say, look at BBK books. We are both apologetical as well as polemical. Now, apologetical is not we apologize for our faith, all right? Apologetical means we defend, we defend. So when people say we are wrong, we will defend. We will not just keep quiet. Ah, you have your beliefs, I have my beliefs. No, we will defend why we take certain stands. Now, polemical, what is polemical? We will attack, meaning to say we will write, we will publicly teach, we will expose um, the ecumenical movement as we have done, the charismatic movement, the Roman Catholic um, errors. We will actively um, expose and teach against them. Now, if you're uncomfortable with that, some people are very uncomfortable. They say, ah, oh, you know, as long as we know it is wrong, <clears throat> there's no need to talk about them. No need to speak against the cults. Um, then you have to refrain from taking membership because eventually you will, you will struggle because in messages, in BBK, these things will come up, all right? So it is a biblical thing because God says, what good is the watchman if he doesn't sound the warning when he sees the enemy? The watchman is planted on a tower to look out for eminent problems, enemies, um, um, dangers to the camp. Now, when he notices that, he must sound the trumpet. If he does, if he does not, then slowly the enemies will get closer and closer, will begin to attack and the enemy will even infiltrate or enter the camp and destroy the camp. All right? So the Bible is clear. Being polemical is not unbiblical and unloving. It is very loving to protect the truth. It is very loving to protect the sheep, protect the soundness of the church. So don't have the wrong idea of love. All right? So biblical separation is... is it's a loving doctrine for the truth, for God's work, and it is not an option. 
All right, come out from among them. Be ye separate. All these verbs are in the commandment mode. They are, they are commands to be obeyed, not optional. Now, let us continue. <clears throat> the next one. Let me see. Okay. Now, when we come to um, Constitution point number um, 6 point, 6 point 10, all right, 6 point 1. Zero, 6.10. The church, having been founded on the principle of biblical separation, may seek fellowship with like-minded BP and other fundamental Bible-believing churches of similar stand for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, what are we saying? Now, we are not isolationists. We do not isolate ourselves. We are not saying we are only true church and we don't fellowship with any other churches and we must stay away from all churches. Sometimes people get the wrong idea that when we are polemical, then, well, that is what we are. Sometimes we have a reputation in Perth itself. They say, well, this church doesn't work with anybody. They, are, they isolate themselves. It is not true. <clears throat> well, in the first place, we work with other sound BP churches in Australia, right? Bethel, for example. Um, um, the church in Brisbane, for example, the church in uh, Sydney, for example, right? Sydney BPC, and so on. <clears throat> we work with them, all right? We invite them. We, um, we engage with one another, all right? For example, even Bethel BPC, um, at this point of time, uh, Reverend Paul Cheng is on our board. So we work with others of um, a similar stand. Don't have this idea that BPs are isolationist. In fact, remember, <clears throat> one of the distinctives of why we became Bible Presbyterians instead of just Presbyterians was right in the beginning, there was a disagreement. The Presbyterian board felt that we, they will only support Presbyterian um, mission work, all right? But this group of Christians felt it is wrong. We should be willing to support any um, work as long as they, are, they subscribe to the fundamentals of the faith and they practice it, and they practice biblical separation. Because there may be some of these people, they may be Baptists, all right, but they are taking a true stand for the Lord and they are isolated. People stop supporting them. We should be willing to support them, all right? So there was a big disagreement, and therefore the Bible Presbyterian movement was formed. <clears throat> that was one of the reasons. So don't think that we are isolationists, all right? We are not. But also don't think that we must go around looking for everyone to support. Right? Of course, we support what is clear, the Bible Presbyterian churches who they are, <clears throat> they are firm, first and foremost. But we are not averse to supporting others, all right? Now, the next one is, that, yeah, so please <clears throat> do not have the wrong um, understanding. We work with many churches in Singapore, um, in Malaysia, in the Philippines, and so on. We, we work with them, right? We are willing to support their work. We send relief help when needed as well. Now, finally, finally, conclusion, <clears throat> all right? Well, actually, there's another thing that was a big issue in this church before, infant baptism. Infant baptism, all right? It was not taught properly. People did not understand. People became members. After they became members, they, they fight against infant baptism. That is wrong. It is clear in the Constitution. We believe in that. So people should not become members, um, take up um, leadership roles when we are against that. It will eventually cause problems, for sure. Now let's come down. Uh, well, i say one more thing. Now remember, I wrote a long pastoral about how we, um, what are the criteria for, for people that we are putting up for the coming elections on the 17th. I make it very clear. They all must write papers stating and proving that they personally um, subscribe to, support, and practice all the beliefs of the church. They cannot be leaders if you say, well, I don't subscribe to infant baptism. I don't subscribe to biblical separation and want to be leaders. Eventually, there will be chaos. Another thing I want to mention before I forget is this. Why is it so important that you must 
If you want to be a member, you must subscribe to everything. Well, the first reason is your vows, obviously, I've mentioned. Now, the second reason is this. Members can vote. Please remember that. Members can vote. And every three years, we have voting of the pastor, the session members, voting on issues in the church that are pertaining, pertaining to constitutional changes, for example. Members can vote. Now, you imagine, if we allow people who don't agree and they grow, and they grow, they are able to vote out those that actually follow the constitution and they can change the church. That is the danger. So that is why we are very protective of this for the peace and the work of the church. All right? Don't be so keen. Why do we have so few members? We want more. We want more. Just let anyone in. It is wrong. It is wrong. Now, finally, um, in conclusion, now, the constitution must not be elevated to a position where it supersedes the Bible. When that happens, we no longer become a God-honoring church and we will turn into a cult soon. So don't just keep um, thinking that constitution, constitution, the constitution is based on the Bible. If over time we realize certain things need to be changed, okay, the constitution is written by men to the best of their knowledge at that point of time in accordance to the word of God or something needs to be added to make sure that we are clear about our stand biblically. Then we have, to, we have to do that, all right? So it does not mean the constitution is not important, all right? Describe the doctrines and the practices of the church, what the church stands for. Um, it's a manual to regulate the behavior and conduct of every Christian, of your member, for harmony, unity, and peace of the church. So we have said many of these things again and again. Membership is important, Christians. Don't be someone who just go through life not being a member of any church resolve those things, sort out those things, be part of the church and be committed. If not, for example here, we can never let you take certain, certain roles. Why? Because we're exclusive. No. If you don't agree with the church beliefs, we cannot let you be a Sunday school teacher because you will end up teaching what you believe and we, we are not there to listen and that is what happened in churches. We cannot let you be part of things in decision making in committees. Because you will decide based on working with ecumenical churches, for example. So there are many things that you cannot do on earth. Now, if you really struggle with the belief, then find a church where you can be a member and serve the Lord wholeheartedly. And I hope it is a biblical church, right? So it is important. Let us turn to God in prayer. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of well, I take the American view. Um, they are the most readily available results. They stopped attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from